it helps to recognize that love doesn't come from something outside of us. And the moment you realize that, like the only person who can ignite your light is you. Mm -hmm. And then the people and situations we surround ourselves with can either dim it or brighten it. Right. Right. And if we can learn that younger, then we recognize life is not happening to us, it's happening for us, mm -hmm. even if it's hard, even if it's nothing like we ever imagined it would be. Right. If we allow ourselves to recognize that this is an offering and we believe in that space, then everything is a lesson. Mm -hmm. And that's an offering. Hello and welcome to Curious Ones podcast by Andara. I'm Yael Ginsberg, the host of the podcast, a yoga and meditation teacher and philosophy lover. Each week you will hear eye-opening interviews with the different teachers of the Andara Yoga Institute located in beautiful Baja, Mexico, along with other teachers that pass through here. This life-changing knowledge shared through authentic, heartfelt communication will help you live a happier, more fulfilled, and connected life. Let's dive in. I'm super excited to have our guest today, Osi Rave, which is from Israel, so I'm extra excited. <laughs> Osi is a beautiful yoga teacher and founder of the Brooklyn Yoga Project, based in Brooklyn, New York, who is leading a chakra retreat here at Yandara. In her younger years, she was a dancer, but after surviving a 40-foot fall with many major injuries, she was introduced to the world of Pilates as a form of movement therapy, which served as a stepping stone to various types of integrative movement, including gyrotonics, gyrokinesis, and yoga. Osi has studied muscular therapy, Thai massage, and reflexology, and is also certified as a doula. Hello, Osi. Welcome to the Hi, podcast. Yes. Thank you for having me. I'm so curious to hear about your journey so far um, because you, you did have a very interesting process. Could you talk about a little bit that process in terms of finding your purpose through um, a struggle that you went through and How did you decide to make yoga your main path and your main mission in life? Uh, I don't think it was a decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I started teaching Pilates a long time ago in the 90s. And then that led me into um, a shiatsu program, which led me to Thailand, where I studied uh, therapeutic Thai massage and worked with Uh, terminally ill people for a little bit and then um, continued as I came back to the city and taught Pilates. Uh, I s met the founder, uh, Julia Horvath of uh, Gyrotonic and Gyrokinesis and his partner Gina and I got to study with them which was insanely amazing, unbelievable people. Mm -hmm. um, again, a wonderful integrative movement therapy using utilizing different equipment that Uh, rehabilitates the spine and offers so much. And the gyrokinesis gyrotonic is the machine work and the floor work. And then I continued on this sort of certification journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I kept, I, I was brought to yoga a lot uh, through dancer friends and through Pilates friends. And um, I, I never took to it. I never, uh, it didn't, I was doing a lot of movement, um, but I wasn't really doing a lot of breath work. And it actually made me really mad. <laughs> Every time I left a yoga class, I think I brought everything up and I never let it out through breath. So it really uh -huh. built inside of me. Um, and when I went to massage therapy school, I was brought to a yoga studio by a friend and the class was taught by a nurse and all of a sudden breath work was touched upon and alignment was touched upon. And I thought, all right, this is the kind of movement I understand. This is the kind of movement I've been teaching. Um, and I'd owned a Pilates and gyrotonic studio for a little while that we closed after September 11th. And then um, I went back to these yoga classes and I started 
going to classes with teachers who were teaching philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and it was weaved into the class. It wasn't thrown at me too much. I started to understand that yoga was a lot more than just this movement on a mat. And it was really a way of life. And I got curious. And I started reading a little bit more about it and recognized that there was no accident in yoga coming in the order that it came to my experience. Because at that moment, I had been through a lot in my life, and I think I was ready to apply the philosophy to my teaching. Um, and that's what I gained from learning more about yoga the eight limbs of yoga and the ability to integrate it as an offering through teaching movement, which was my platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the more I learn, the more I learned, and then the more I learn, the more I learn. And <laughs> it's and I think that having a passion and work that I do in this life that is consistent that I'll never be done with allows me to always love what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is yoga your passion? Yes. In what way? It resonates with the way I was raised. Um, my mom really did raise us to see ourselves as reflections of everyone and everything else in the world, um, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it really is the only form of movement that integrates how I am with myself and teaches me that in a way that I can then see how I am with everyone and everything else. Mm -hmm. I love what you just said. And I think that I would love to talk about finding your passion because I don't think that the path, as you said, that your path went through different, many different ways and different forms and that it also needed to happen in the order that it did happen for you to be able to receive it. But could you maybe reflect a little bit over your path and how did you know to sense that which direction you need to go that um how did you develop it into a passion because usually I find that it doesn't we're not like there's not a moment that we're like okay this is my passion but it kind of like develops over time right yeah I think I was lucky enough to have uh my mom my guide who talked a lot about dharma what our what our dharma is what our purpose is she never used the word dharma she mm. always said our purpose we're all here with a purpose what's your purpose and um i did a lot of reflecting on that through my whole life even when i was a child and i would come home and tell her stuff about school and she'd say okay well what is your purpose in this role we have three ways of interacting with people we're either the teacher the student or both the teacher and student mm -hmm. so whatever it is that shows up for us in that moment is meant to be, whether it's your dharmic karma or this other person involved or group of people, it's not always just about us. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that with that way of understanding my interactions with the world around me, I got to a place where certain things no longer fed me anything. It was just a job. It was no longer work. Mm -hmm. It was no longer my work, my offering. And I did feel with a lot of the different forms of movement that I was teaching, not to take anything away. I mean, I am walking because of these forms of movement and opportunities uh, that I got to a place where there wasn't so much more I could learn um, except for the exchange that I was having with my students, which there's always something to learn. We're always the teacher to, uh, to the student and the student to the teacher. Um, but I think that when I understood more about yoga and started under seeing it happening in my life seeing it happening on the street i was like oh this is so much beyond what happens in the classroom mm -hmm. or in the yoga studio or whatever it is that it's exchanged in and it showed up in everything i realized it really is the root of every form of movement and of a lot of different therapies um and learning about the eight limbs of yoga and how I am with myself and how I am with the world around me and then noticing how everyone else is with themselves and the world around us and realizing these are the conversations I want to have. Mm -hmm. This is this is what feeds my soul and it aligns with my dharma, my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that 
recognition of what that is. And our dharma is always, in my opinion, the same, but it changes what it looks like as we change. Throughout our lives, it kind of takes on different forms. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned seeing yoga outside of the yoga class and out of the studio. I was wondering, what does practicing yoga look like for you? So practicing yoga on my mat um, is my ability to reconnect with myself, meaning I remind myself that I have to breathe more. I remind myself that I am not my thoughts. Um, there's something really incredible. We talked about it today in our training, in our retreat, is that you know our heart beats in our body and we don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. We breathe and we don't have to think about it. But when we bring attention to these things that keep us alive, we receive a much different level of life, a much different form of what we're offered. And so in the physical practice, I like my kids will be like, mommy, you should really go to yoga. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it grounds me. Yeah. Um, and right now in the state of this world, my head, like anybody else's, can get so loud mm -hmm. that the only thing that can quiet it is getting on the mat and breathing and moving. Mm -hmm. Outside of the studio, off the physical mat, I think yoga shows up everywhere um, in the conversations I have, in the way that I feel people walking down the street, the way I raise my kids, um, doing teacher trainings for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. um, what shows up in teacher trainings are the things that happen as we grow up and these things that we're told and these things that were heard. And so the practice of yoga with my children is to try to shift out of that habitual way of speaking to them and bringing them right to where I am because I am you and you are me right mm -hmm. and so that gives them a lot of power it empowers them but it also allows for them to feel held mm -hmm. and so to me that's the balance of yoga right we are the balance between strength and surrender light and dark challenge and ease and how can we find that and so through our awareness, the yamas and niyamas and all the different ways of our Ten Commandments of Yoga remind us, and they use certain language that sometimes resonates with people and sometimes doesn't, but in general, it's like, be a good person, Yeah. right? Offer out what you want to receive, but the only way to offer out is to be able to receive. Like, if I can't pause and find love, then I have nothing to give. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the goal. And that's what my kids will always say. You know, yeah. Mommy just says that we have to be love. And once we're love, everything will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> they say that. Oh, yeah. Do you feel like they, they're learning to practice it as well? They are. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're empaths, which mm -hmm. is both a, a curse and a, a lovely <laughs> blessing mm -hmm. um, at, at their ages. But um But I do think that it helps. It helps to recognize that love doesn't come from something outside of us. And the moment you realize that, like the only person who can ignite your light is you. Mm -hmm. And then the people and situations we surround ourselves with can either dim it or brighten it. Right. Right. And if we can learn that younger, then we recognize life is not happening to us. It's happening for us, mm -hmm. even if it's hard, even if it's nothing like we ever imagined it would be. Right. If we allow ourselves to recognize that this is an offering and we believe in that space, then everything is a lesson. Mm -hmm. And that's an offering. Yeah, that it's all it's all in our control. Right. How we react to what happens. Exactly. And we were talking about this before you and I about um, that. Actually, anything that happens in our inner world is the is what reflects to our outer world and if we want to have any control over the outer world it starts with going inside and taking control of what happens inside yeah. that's not always easy <laughs> not easy <laughs> right um so maybe could you help us understand kind of what your process was in learning to navigate that in your own life and then how do you teach others to learn to do that I mean I'm still learning <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning and um, 
my ego wins over my heart a lot. Temptation wins over opportunity a lot. Uh, but I really think that that is the work that is done is to pause in a situation as we move through life, through challenges, through unexpected situations, through world pandemics, whatever it is that we're moving through, to pause and really feel. Because if you can teach someone pranayama, if you could teach someone how to breathe and recognize that when we breathe completely, that's the only time we are fully taking something in. And until we have something, we can't let it out, right? Mm -hmm. If I say to you, yeah, I'll put an apple down, but I haven't given you the apple yet, you haven't picked it up yet, you can't put it down, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to take it in, whatever it is, Mm. and then we can put it back down and what happens is that we've grown up in this culture where it's like no 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 don't cry don't feel anger don't do this stuff and so it's like how can I get to a place of calm if I'm always pushing it down or pushing it away right we're balanced like we said before strength surrender light dark Mm -hmm. challenge ease to find it we have to feel all the extremes Mm -hmm. and so I guess part of it is overcoming the fear of being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and recognizing the impermanence of all things and knowing that it's impermanent and allowing it to be only then can we allow it to come in so that we can let it go Mm -hmm. so I think teaching breath work is a really nice way to help people get out of the story in their head and physically feel what's happening Mm -hmm. And when we can do that, I think it will resonate more with thoughts and feelings, right? Because the breath is, the breath will tell you if you're okay. If Mm -hmm. I'm breathing, even if it's really hard, but I can breathe, then I'm okay. If I can't, then I'm suffering. Yeah. Right? Struggle and suffer are two very different things. Is the door locked or is it stuck, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that a lot of the times when... I think of, okay, so now I can always find the answers within. It's just a matter of kind of being able to sense it. But there is two voices in my head. There's the voice of the ego, and then there's my higher guidance, the way that I call it, you know. And it's not always easy to recognize which one is talking, which one is present. Do you know... Or can you maybe give advice about how to know, how do we know which one is talking and how do we connect to the one that is actually leading us where we want to go? I do think that it, it it's really hard. And I think that there are moments where we are 100% honest with ourselves and we step back from the external. What does it look like? What do other people think? How, what's this going to be like later? And we really feel the ego is loud. The heart is intense, right? So that difference between the head and the heart is they're both telling us something. I guess the advice or what I would offer is getting quiet, meditation, mm-hmm. Um pausing and really listening enough that you can hear your heart whispering over your head yelling Mm -hmm. and recognize does this really hurt my heart or is my ego affected because it doesn't make me look like the person I think everyone thinks I am or it doesn't it's not the answer people want me to give them or whatever you know Mm -hmm. whatever the ego ignites I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think, <laughs> I think that finding enough silence to be able to hear is what I'm understanding from your answer. And that's beautiful. I want to share something with you. Yesterday, um, when I approached you about doing this podcast, I was actually going through something in my personal life and I was feeling kind of heavy because of it. And I was supposed to make a decision or actually like write um a message to someone and I was feeling very unclear and I was feeling very much in my ego and after our conversation it was maybe five minutes our conversations I felt completely different and I felt that I really went down from my head to my heart and the the message that I ended up writing was so much more aligned with 
who I want to be in the world. And it's incredible because I was reflecting on it after and I was saying like, we didn't even talk about the situation that I'm in. We didn't talk about anything too, too, you know, deep. But it was this small interaction that really shifted my whole feeling. That's amazing. <laughs> and I do think, you know, it's funny. I have students who say to me, I feel like I know so much about you, but I don't know anything about you <laughs> um, <laughs> through practice. And I think that, you know, I had a teacher in, in physical therapy school in college who she said to me, you know, I'd been through, I had a lot of injuries and I had a really hard time working with people who had these like little broken finger, this and that would complain. And I was like, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, OC, if you live your life trying to understand why someone feels a certain way, your life is going to be really long and really exhausting. She <laughs> said, however, if you just listen to what they're feeling, uh, you might say, why does that make you sad? But you know what sad feels like. Mm -hmm. So you connect with an emotion. I know what sad feels like. I know what mad feels like. I know what happy and joy feels like. Mm -hmm. And that's the relation, right? Nobody's going to have the same experience ever. Even if right. you spend 24 hours with someone, you're totally going to have two completely different experiences. Right. But what we can connect on is those feelings, right? Energetically, it's there. Words don't need to be said about it, like you said. We can connect on something in a way that's like, oh my God, I know what that feeling of loss or that feeling of joy, I know what that is. And whatever followed that that might resonate is this beautiful exchange. And it's the story around it that takes away from it, right? Mm -hmm. Even when you're trying to explain an emotion, what happens? Yeah. We change it because we're trying to talk to whatever, whoever's around us thinking, well, they're not going to understand it this way or this way. And then the feeling is changed, mm -hmm. right? So feelings are way too big for words. But when we can connect on what it felt like, not why, mm -hmm. I feel like it can really offer what someone needs with so much less of the story. The story is what gets mm -hmm. in our way. That's the ego. Yeah. Right. How do you feel sad? Because blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. is, have you ever had just had someone say, I feel sad and be like, OK. Oh, no. Right. I feel like we always try to like find a solution for them or make them feel better. And that's like Santosha, like in, in yoga, where mm -hmm. they say like contentment now, mm -hmm. right? Can you be content right now? And if you listen to the world, it's like, it'll be better when. It'll be better when I get my degree. It'll be better when I buy a house. It'll be better when I'm in a relationship. It'll be better. No, it's not going to be better. Mm -hmm. It might be different, but it's not going to be better. Mm -hmm. So we're in this world of, of connecting. And so often what disconnects us is the ego. It pulls the hearts away because it's trying to explain something that can't be explained, right? Mm -hmm. So reaction response, right? That, that's yeah. kind of what we want to play with. Like, can we release the reaction and pause? But in this day and age, you have your cell phones and we have this immediate gratification and someone sends something and before it's even complete, before you even read it completely, you're already responding <laughs> and reacting and it's like, Poof. Yeah. right? If someone just paused, we talked about this today in the teacher training, like, do you remember those dial up phones? Mm -hmm. It took like 10 minutes. Like if you wanted to react by the time you could talk to the person, the reaction has calmed down, right? <laughs> But we're in such a hurry mm -hmm. that like we are so far from what does it actually feel like? Yeah. We're just in what it sounds like. And what it yeah. sounds like disconnected from what it feels like is just maybe different than what you expected it to be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make it wrong. Yeah. I love what you said about trying to see the other person's point of view, but not from the mind, uh, but from the feeling, not thinking like, Okay, maybe we don't see things the same, but I can understand what they're feeling right now and connect with them on that level. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I do think that that maybe is, is something that I integrate in this teaching of trying to get to a place where we live in a yogic lifestyle, right, in mm -hmm. the awareness of, because to recognize, you know, you hear it all together, yoga and yoking, and we're all one and da, 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 and it's all these words, but what does that feel like? Mm -hmm. Right? What does it feel like? Because yeah. we're all having a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. However, that, um, those emotions, those emotions are real and they're raw and they can connect us in a way that a story, 
I don't think can. Mm-hmm. Wow, I, I, I feel like there's so much to, to take in <laughs> from what you said. Connecting with others on the f- level of feeling. How does it feel for you to practice yoga, this oneness? How does that feel in your body? Sometimes it feels effortless. And sometimes it hurts like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and most of the time it has to do with what's happening in my head. Mm-hmm. You know, I love a self-practice, but Dennis, who I'm here doing my retreat with, um, sometimes I go to his class simply because I need to listen to his words. Yeah. Not even to move my body. I'll move my body and that's lovely and wonderful. But sometimes it's just that shifted perspective or that gentle reminder. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and the movement of yoga is just the outlet to get to that. space definitely i i relate with that so much because yoga what i found so attracting about yoga is that it addresses our inner world as well as the outer world and to be honest at my point right now in my practice after many many years practicing i'm way more drawn to the philosophy of yoga and to conversations like this than the physical practice But I do understand that the physical is a way to get to the inner world. Yeah, I mean, I've seen so many people in the last 20 years of teaching that have come in for the physical. Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, it's like I was sitting at my desk and I just couldn't wait to get to yoga and decompress. Mm. That's the first part. Yeah. Right. And then they start to notice how they are with their body. Are they pushing too hard? Are they breathing? How is breathing? Or that first practice, that first practice where you breathe through the whole thing, mm-hmm. it shifts everything. Yeah. And so it doesn't have to be a decision. Like if you choose to practice yoga, eventually, in my opinion, the rest of it starts to show up. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, the practice becomes much more powerful when you've gone through the first few steps. Uh, before the asana mm-hmm. um, the yamas and the niyamas and understanding that I think it and 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 then teaching yourself about the breath work or learning about the breath work uh, but yeah I really do I just I think that you can just simply step onto your mat and if you commit to that the rest of it does show up mm-hmm. you have to listen yeah. you for sure have to listen to yeah. yourself but Okay, let's talk about the yamas and niyamas. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, it's two words that feel very um, unattainable and very far from our day-to-day life, but actually they're very much to do with just having a good human experience. And I thought it, you have a very interesting point of view about them, connecting them to the chakras. And the chakras are a lot more... known and accessible people you know they're a lot more in our language but then yamas and yamas are not so maybe you can explain a little bit where they come from a little bit about what they are and then go into their connection to the chakras well the there isn't any I don't think any direct response correlation to each one but yamas and niyamas are basically you know how I am with myself in the world and how I'm with the world around me mm-hmm. and it, within each one um, it's really about being a good person it's about mm-hmm. having awareness of the world around you it's and to do that we have to have awareness of ourself right if I don't know how I am how can I know how you are yeah <laughs> um, and through the chakra system from the root to the crown uh, You know one of the first things that you learn is this this root chakra is that safe place that safety that stability that solidity if that's coming from something outside of you then that means it can be taken away from you yeah it has to start with yourself and that solid ground has to come from a place where you believe in this earth that we're on the bigger you I believe the bigger picture and that grounding down of allowing yourself to be held and that comes from trusting yourself right mm-hmm. and to be tr- and to trust yourself I feel like you really need to have the ability to be um, real yeah right am I harming a him am I harming anyone mm-hmm. am I taking from people or from mm-hmm. myself am I harming myself right am I 
Am I being clean with my thoughts, with my feelings, with the food that I'm eating? Mm -hmm. Right. So you go through, am I, am I always needing more? Am I finding contentment? Right. Going through all of them will take forever. But yeah. this idea of way of being, and the truth is, is that if you look at them, they really mirror each other. They're different wording, but it's each of them sort of correlate the same with this idea of non-stealing, non-harming, uh, not being gluttonous, you know, finding how how we think and how we treat ourselves in the world around us and all of that stuff. So to me, the, the way that they cross over so beautifully is that this idea of the chakra system working from the root to the crown, from our stability to our connection to all things, mm -hmm. right? Um, they feed off of one another. So what comes before it and after it is going to ignite the one that we're on. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess simply saying and not taking forever to talk about it is that once I'm solid in my root, I am solid enough that whatever shows up in my life, I can flow with. Mm -hmm. So you move to that second sacral chakra, that fluidity. Yeah. And if I'm grounded enough to allow myself to flow with what shows up, that means that my power, my self-esteem, my confidence is there because if I'm confident enough to go with what shows up, right, then yes, it is the ego, but it's not the negative ego. Sometimes yeah. it has too much negative uh, connected to it. So now I'm grounded, grounded enough to flow, right? Feeling confident to let myself flow that now I'm open to receive and to offer love. Mm -hmm. And once I can receive and offer love, I can speak my truth. And when I speak my truth, then the illusion of fear and whatever from the third eye, you get to the yeah. space of non-illusion. You can be yeah. that kid again. You can see the world like your dreams. Mm -hmm. And only then, when you get back to that childlike love, can you connect to all the things. Yeah. Right? And to do all of these things, your yamas and yamas have to be in check. Uh-huh. Okay, I understand. Right? So, yeah. I mean, that's a very quick sort of way of doing it. But also, it's like tangible, right? The thing about yoga is that everyone's like, oh, I don't know the Sanskrit and I, Sanskrit, and I don't know the word about this and the world about that. And I don't know, da, 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 da. But it's a way of being, mm -hmm. right? It's a way of being. And so if we take away all of the noise and all of the fancy stuff and we get down to the root of it, It's about being a good person. Mm -hmm. It's about being aware of ourselves. And it's about taking, holding ourselves accountable for where we're at. Can I be here right now? Right? And that's hard. Yeah. Presence is so hard right now. Yeah. Right? But when we live by these things, if you're really in your truth, which is one of, one of them as well, is yeah. that I don't have to go back and wonder, what did I say to that person? And... What did I do with that person? I am clear because there was clarity around it. There was truth around it. And it doesn't matter where I'm coming from. I don't have to go back because I was there every step of the way in my truth. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not an easy way to live no. at all. No. But the goal of it will get us to this place where once we get there and those things are even just touched upon, then the balance becomes easier. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you get there, something else big happens and throws you down and then you have to start all over again. But yeah. that's the beauty of impermanence, right? Mm -hmm. So we feel like, oh God, this is so huge and I can't get past it. And then we finally allow ourselves, like I use, I use the image a lot when I teach. It's like when you see this, you know, see a huge uh, obstacle in the middle of the road and it looks like a rock, it looks solid, right? But then you approach it slowly, closer and closer and closer, and you start to lean into it and you realize it's sand. And you realize that it's not about pushing it out of the way or walking around it. It's about leaning into it. Can I lean into this obstacle? Mm -hmm. Can I slowly lean? And as I lean, as it starts to soften and I let myself into it, then I can get through it. Mm -hmm. Right? But we're always pushing it or yeah. finding a way around it. Yeah. And guess what? karmically, it's going to keep coming back, mm -hmm. right? If everything happens for a lesson and we miss it the first time, it's going to come back. Yes. First, it's going to tap, then it's going to knock, then it's going to bang, and then mm -hmm. it's going to explode, right? Yeah. And we all know that. We've yes. all been there. Yes. And so where is that space where we can get to a place where the, we can hear the tap, mm -hmm. right? I think that yeah. makes a difference. So with the chakras and with the yamas and niyamas and with everything coming together, The reality of it is that 
It's really about can I see myself and meet myself right where I am today? Yeah. Right? Because a lot of us, we go through life and life is not hard. Life is not easy. Right? They mm-hmm. say that the human form, coming back as, the, as a human, is the highest level of suffering. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. So whatever we've all done, <laughs> this is what we've come to, uh-huh. which I get. Right? Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's a hard thing to come back to. Right. And in that, can we receive it and recognize that everything that's showing up is here to get us to the next place that we're meant to be? Yeah. Not to do now for later, to, to be here now for now, but to also recognize that it's to get us to the next place. Yeah. Right. We can't skip this, mm-hmm. whatever this might be. Yeah. Right. And so I totally forgot where we started on this, but I feel like that's a big part of it. Yeah, it's it's so, so true. Um, I want to say about what you said about the human experience being uh, the mo- the highest level of suffering. I guess it's probably because we're also ready for the biggest amount of growth and the, that the obstacles that we deal with and that show up in our life are just a way to get us back on the path if we kind of veered off right if if something isn't happening the way that we kind of wanted it to happen or thought it will happen it's always in my experience it's always been to guide me to something that's more accurate for me and more aligned with kind of my dharma my my purpose here on earth and i also love what you mentioned about the chronological Um, order of the progression of the chakras in relation to just these simple life guidance rules because that's what really drew me to yoga that it's not a religion that's telling you do these crazy practices because god told you and you're worshiping to this god that you know that feels so very far away from everyday life and this is Yoga is so non-religious. It's so, people think that it is, but it's just basic rules, right? Cleanliness. Cleanliness of your surroundings and your words and the way that you speak and non-harming. So again, the words that you use, not harming yourself and not harming others. And, you know, it's, it's just so simple, these steps. And I also loved what you said, con- how you connected them to if you just live your life in a clean way, in a way that's kind to yourself and to others, then you have this balance of grounding and rooting and finding yourself and being able to flow with the changes of life and having the strength to to really show up in your full expression of who you are meant to be. Can you talk a little bit about your personal journey with allowing yourself to really be authentically you in the world? Kind of. (laughs) I think it's a lifelong practice. I feel like um, it took a long time for me to get to a place where I was not worried about how I was perceived. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it took some really intense loss uh, and really intense experiences for me to get to a place where I realized that it's much easier to connect to people when things are not perfect. Mm -hmm. I have so much more to talk about with a person if I say I'm having a hard time, then my life is great, my kids are great, my job is perfect, my relationship is everything, and everyone's (laughs) like, yeah, I have nothing to say to you, right? Like, who? that's not real. But for a long time, that was, and for a lot of people still in this world, this is how they present themselves because Mm -hmm. They feel that that's what is expected. That's what is wanted. That's going to put them somewhere, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I thought that for a long time when I was younger, just the way I think I saw the world around me. Mm -hmm. And the more I learned that feeling things is okay and things being messy is okay, Mm -hmm. um, it, it started helping me to reconnect to myself, which made it so much easier to connect to other people in a different way. Right. Like we all have experiences in our life. If I become everything that happens to me, 
then I get to a place where I'm so full of everything that's happened to me, nothing else is going to happen anymore. Now I'm abuse or now I'm fear or now I'm accidents or now I'm this or now I'm that. But I'm the experience is there to teach us. We take it in, we let it go, and we move on, right? And to me, that is what creates that ability to have the yoga, to have the practice, to have the connections mm -hmm. with people. And the most important thing, I think, through all of this is people want to be seen and heard. Yeah. That's it. And loved. And loved and love. That, I think, love comes from being seen and heard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in my life someone has come and just told me everything because they don't feel seen and heard ever. Mm -hmm. And I have no responsibility when I speak to anybody, my closest friends, my children are, are total strangers in feeling that I am here to fix anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just need to be seen and heard. No, yeah. no one is broken. Nothing needs yeah. to be fixed. But the idea of talking about an emotion that's not some sort of joyful, perfect thing a lot of time is received as like, oh shit, now what do I do? What do I have to say? How do I fix this? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, 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 you have to step back. It's just about expression, but also safe, a safe space to express. Yeah, I don't expect or need anyone to be any particular way. And in fact, I love it when someone says something that I completely did not see coming. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, that scared me. For a long time, I couldn't say, I don't know. I say, I don't know all the time now. And I love it yeah. because then I get to learn, mm -hmm. right? But I think it's holding the space. I think it's allowing ourselves to be messy, mm -hmm. like really messy, yeah, right? And learning that like, it's okay to not be okay. And that's the one I'm working on now. Yeah, it's okay to not be okay. But I feel like there's a lot of times this fear from really allowing yourself to not be okay around other people and that it's not always received right a hundred percent yeah and the minute you tell someone you're not okay then they're worried so now you have to take care of them mm -hmm. so now you're not caring for yourself anymore which yeah. is a lot of reason why people like I move through this stuff mainly by myself. Mm -hmm. And I have a huge support system of, a, system of incredible people in my life. And the moment you share something deep with somebody, if you haven't processed it on your own, will then become their version of your experience. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I'm not saying talking about stuff isn't important. It's very important. I do it all the time. But the processing of it, I think, has to happen internally. And then only then can there be a conversation around it that doesn't shift what it is that you're really moving through mm -hmm. and become the other person's. Like you can share something with me and I can hear every word, but I'm going to feel my interpretation of what you're sharing with me. Yeah. If you've processed it, then our exchange can be really beautiful and reflective. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't, then it could be my processing of the situation. Yeah. Right. It's the same in a yoga practice. One person looks next to them. Oh, that person's doing a headstand. I should do a headstand. Yeah. But no, did you just come from their house and do their work and eat their food? Or did you come from your house and your, you know? Yeah. So I feel like that mm -hmm. piece of being not being okay that we're talking about, why it's so hard is that I do think it, just like all of this stuff, it's a real personal journey. It has to start from in. Yeah. Especially when it has something to do with the other person. Yeah. When you when you bring it up, when you haven't yet processed it, it kind of could come out as blame or as um I guess with without any clarity of where you're trying to take this conversation, right? You, Which just, circles <laughs> it around, right? And then yeah. we go back to what we talked about earlier. That's your ego, not your heart. Exactly. If, I, if I'm if i just talking and I don't know what I actually want out of the conversation, it's mm -hmm. never going to end. That was my yeah. mom used to say that to me all the time. If you start a conversation, know how you want it to end or it will never end, right? <laughs> Meaning a confrontational conversation. Yeah. Uh, and if I do that too, then I'm just from my ego. Mm -hmm. It's like I want to win, but I don't even know what I want to win. Yeah. But if I pause yeah. and I feel it, what yeah. am I feeling? Uh -huh. Then I can share it through the heart. 
And that's a totally different exchange. Mm. Beautiful. Your mom sounds like an amazing person. The most amazing. (laughs) Hey, I'm quickly interrupting the episode to extend an invitation. If you are interested in deepening into any of the subjects we talk about on the podcast, we offer many different experiences on our beautiful grounds here in Baja, Mexico. From nine-day modules such as sound healing and yoga nidra, to breath and meditation, as well as two or 300-hour yoga teacher trainings, and many different shorter retreats. Check out our website, yandara.com, to see all the information about the different experiences. Let's get back to the episode. Could you share with us what is one wound that your ego has had to deal with? There have been a lot. (laughs) Everybody. I think when I was younger, uh, and auditioning to dance and to perform, um, I came from Boston where I was dancing and I moved to New York and I felt like I was like, I got this. And then everywhere I went was like, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too skinny, you're too fat, you have too much technique, you don't have enough technique. And I started really questioning myself and I was Mm -hmm. like, whoa, like I just got knocked down. Mm -hmm. That feeling um, showed up again like three or four years into teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. So this is like a good amount of time later. And I was teaching and I was young. I was a young teacher. When people told me that class was great, I was like, yeah, I'm doing this. And Mm -hmm. I don't think I was ever a teacher that performed, but I still needed my ego to be fed. I didn't feel super, super strong and safe yet. I didn't feel like I do now, which is like, this is an offering. This has nothing to do with me. And if somebody enjoys a class, I love that they enjoy a class, but I love it for them. Right. And I love that I can offer something and that exchange can happen. But back then I needed to know how was class. I needed people to tell me how good it was. And that's and that happened. Yeah. It happened as 23, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day one of my teachers came and he said, I'm coming to take your class. I'm hearing all these things. And at the end of class, he said, it was all right. (sighs) Oh my God. (laughs) And I was just floored because I got so in my head that I performed that class. Probably one of the only ones ever. Like I, and I remember after he said it being so shot down and Mm -hmm. like it threw me so much. And it took a little while, but that moment made me a different teacher. Mm -hmm. In what way? Uh, I stopped needing people to tell me if class was good and started letting myself feel if it was good. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, there are days where I will teach and be like, whoa, I just missed the mark. And people will come and say how much it landed for them. And then there are days where I'm like, wow, that class was so grounded. And everyone's like, thanks, Oz. Have a good day. Bye. And there is no exchange for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's still real. So to me, the classes that land for me are the ones that are feeding me. And the classes that land for others that maybe didn't feed is still a beautiful exchange, Mm -hmm. but it's not necessary. My goal is not to impress anyone. My goal Mm -hmm. is to hold space for people, to have an exchange and a conversation. We're Mm -hmm. all living in this crazy world. We all need to pause. And can we pause together? Mm -hmm. And can we take this time just for a moment? And that to me, the conversations I have with my students before we even go into the room, Mm -hmm. that's yoga. What happens in the classroom is just getting everyone back to themselves, Mm -hmm. right? So it's not a good or bad class. It's an exchange and an opportunity. And it took me a long time Mm -hmm. to learn that, a long time. But that's where my ego was definitely, Mm. yeah. Yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about, sense of self, right? Knowing yourself enough that what other people experience doesn't affect your own experience. Are there certain practices that you had to strengthen your sense of self? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are... uh, (laughs) There are times where I hear myself... And it's different than what I feel. 
And that came up actually a lot with all of the teaching on Zoom with COVID. Mm -hmm. I hate I hate being on camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate hearing my own voice. <sighs> and my students will tell you, like, when I talk in class, I'm talking and exchanging. And if you ask me something that I said in class, I will not remember. <laughs> I will not. I mean, every once in a while. But, yeah. like, I just, I won't. Mm -hmm. And I all of a sudden was teaching these classes, and then I had to listen to them, and I had to put them onto this Patreon. I had to do, and it was like, it really, uh, it threw me. Mm -hmm. and I needed to I needed to be nicer to myself about it mm -hmm. and that's what brought me back like I didn't sound the way that I thought that it was being offered mm -hmm. but it was being received in the way that I wanted it to be received and so I had to let go not be like oh I want to change this and I want to change that because it's not about me yeah Right. And yeah. so that's where that, I guess, lesson came in was this is your truth. It might not sound like you want it to sound. Maybe it wasn't the perfect thing or you switched your light or whatever it was. Right. But it's not about that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that did check me for a minute to say, stop trying to make it sound more clear or perfect or this or that, which is not I'm never going for perfection. That's not real. But there was something it triggered me I can't yeah. even put the words to it mm -hmm. uh, but I I really pushed against that platform for a long time mm -hmm. and then after realizing that I was like okay I'm gonna lean into it like the rock right <laughs> yeah yeah I'm leaning into it again. lean into it yeah. definitely and you also said that you kind of needed to be kinder to yourself in how because I feel like we're our own uh worst critics right? oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah and it's um a lot for me I feel like it's definitely there's still a long way to go on this journey of really rooting in who I am maybe even my life's journey um, but for me it kind of looks like what you said being kinder to myself and what I focus on right not focusing on my mistakes and how I could have done it better but looking at what I did good and what I do like about how I acted and letting that be where I lead from and another thing that you said is letting it come from truth if it's rooted in truth in the truth of who you are and the truth of what you want to share and people receive it as truth then that's the most important right a hundred percent and it's a lifelong journey for everyone because yeah. impermanence is real and it's always changing so it's not mm -hmm. like oh I've mastered this thing called life mm -hmm. because every time you're riding a wave eventually it's going to crash mm -hmm. right and that sounds negative but it's not it's like we are promised two things when we're born change and death yeah right so we're moving in that direction knowing that everything is going to change and it is going to be a lifelong practice and we're going to learn and we're going to fall and we're going to get back up and we're going to fall and we're going to get back up mm -hmm. right and allowing ourselves to do that makes all of this yoga stuff <laughs> more accessible yeah oh, i want to take all of this <laughs> <laughs> you are i am i am and luckily i have uh i have a video of it a recording <laughs> can listen to it over and over again <laughs> beautiful so let's go on to our closing curiosity questions um you know what i have a question i want to ask before that What is an important mistake that you made? Well, I guess I, I don't think that I would use the word mistake because I feel like everything has taught me something. Right. Everything. I do think that I am an impulsive person. And before kids, I would just wake up one day and be like, I gotta go. And I would leave and I'd go and I'd do all these things. And I feel like when I have an idea, I'm like, oh, that's what needs to happen next. And I want it to happen right now. Mm -hmm. So I think my judgment on those things, whatever word we're using, um, I, I learned from those uh, fight or flight reactions towards that stuff that sometimes just because I'm clear in my mind, it might not necessarily be on that path mm -hmm. yet. 
Mm -hmm. So I said earlier, like the door is stuck or the door is locked. Yeah. Like I have tried to pull on a locked door a lot Mm -hmm. until I realized, okay. And then later that thing has shown up in my life with such ease, right? Before I opened my studio, I was ready to open my own space. It didn't work out. I had to open it for other people. And it was not a mistake, but it was a very hard experience for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. And when I finally opened my own space, it was so easy, Mm -hmm. like so easy. Everything was literally just fell into place in this way that I was like, oh, it was the right thing. I knew what I wanted. Yeah. It just wasn't yet. Yeah. And I feel like that's sort of a nice example for a lot of the impulsive things I've done in my life and being like, it, I, it's too soon. And so it's too hard to do. It's like eating a fruit before it's ripe, right? Yeah. It's not that it's not going to be sweet and delicious, mm-hmm. but if I eat it now, it's like bitter and hard. Yeah. And those two, I, I've, I've learned that it's taken a long time. Yeah. And My mom used to study NLP, Neuro Linguistics Processing, and she used to always say, the moment we have an idea or a question in the conscious state of our our mind, the answer and the timing is in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And until that answer shows up, it's not time yet. Wow. And I always loved it so much because I thought, well, yeah, but if it's back there and this is up here, now I have to look for it. And she was like, no, you have to be patient. Yeah. It's like baking a cake. Yeah. You make it, you put it in the oven, you have to wait. Yeah. Right? And so cake was our thing. Chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, mm. but, but it was so real. And, and the more I practiced that, the more I realized that those mistakes or those um, poor timing habits Mm -hmm. (laughs) um we're really just uh, being in a rush to get to where I'm going next when what I needed was to to stay right where I am yeah right they say it all the time when we're kids you're in a big luna park and you get lost stay right where you are and we will find you yeah and then we grow up and we feel a little lost and we run yeah But what we need to do is sit right where we are and find ourselves again. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when these things come, at least for me in my life, I need a change. It's because something needs to be completed that maybe I can't access yet. Mm -hmm. And so I need to just pause. And so I I guess long-winded answer for the mistake is really that. Like just just pause. Just Mm -hmm. wait for a moment and see what it looks like in a little while. Yeah, wow. Your answer is hitting me right in the heart it's so relevant to my life personally and I love what you said because it connects also to what we were saying before that when we're trying to get clarity about a decision is it coming from the ego or is it coming from our higher self higher guidance Uh, you mentioned that a good thing is to pause and sit with it and let the silence allow the answer to arise and it connects to this in that it doesn't usually it doesn't usually come up right away right right it it takes a while and i love what you said that it's if the question is in the conscious then the answer is in the subconscious but we just have to let it i guess let the process happen of allowing ourselves to be ready to receive the answer a hundred percent Oh, I, I want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Then you should. <laughs> <laughs> I might. <laughs> Tears are good. Tears are good. Yeah. It's just because I have this thing with my life as well. I always want to be already where I want to go. And sometimes it takes time and respecting the time that it needs to take and re- respecting each level that you need to go through to be ready to receive what you are trying to manifest or how you want your life to look like yeah so much Mm -hmm. and we we actually covered that today in the shadow self part of the heart chakra is um this when you land in the shadow when you're always a step ahead of the sun Mm -hmm. right and when we're in this shadow this area of suffering of pain um It, we get stuck where we want to we don't want to feel this we keep going and we keep going and we keep going and now we're just in the shadow of it 
Mm-hmm. If we just sit for a second, then the sun will come back. Then that warmth yeah. will fill us. Then we'll feel the air moving through our body again, that element of the heart, and be able to recognize that we are, we're we running from something if we're in such a hurry. Mm-hmm. We might not know what it is, and we might not need to know yeah. what it is, but we do feel it. Yeah. And in that moment of like, why do I keep hurrying up to wait, hurrying up to wait? It's like we are moving to someone else's rhythm, someone else's pace. Yeah. Or chasing something. Or chasing something. Mm-hmm. Totally. Right? So the the practice is being present, sitting with it? Yeah. I think we need we all need to slow down. Mm-hmm. I think everybody needs to slow down. And I think that if we really allow ourselves to treat ourselves the way that we treat the most important people in our lives, with that compassion and that patience and that love, everything starts to shift. And when we recognize that even if it doesn't feel comfortable, we have to wait a moment and this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Then it gets, uh, gives us what, whatever it is that we need to go to where we want to go. Like it's not that what we're craving or, or feeling is not where we're going next. It's just, what if you get there and the door is locked? You got to mm-hmm. wait for them to unlock the door. You got to open this one and walk around and then unlock it and then come back through, right? Yeah. So maybe there's just a different direction that you have to take to get there. Yeah. And so that's that pause. Meditation is impossible for so many people because they never stop and listen to what they're thinking about. Mm-hmm. And when they do, it's usually different than what they want it to sound like. Mm-hmm. Right. But who but listen, if you can't hang out with yourself, how can you expect other people to want to hang out with you? Yes, very, true. very true. Right. Mm-hmm. So we find that place. And the funny part of it is, is the minute that you love hanging out with yourself, everyone wants to hang out with you. <laughs> very, very true. Ugh. I'm loving hanging out with you. I love hanging out with you. It's so great. And I feel so honored. Thank you. Me too. Me too. And unfortunately, we're arriving. That's <laughs> fine. This is no, more organic of anyway. <laughs> of course. Luckily, I have you here for a few more days. Yes. But um, for the sake of the interview, we'll go to the closing curiosity questions. Um, what is something you've changed your mind about? How I hope to raise my children. Mm. Um, I think I felt like I really needed to map out things for them. And now I'm learning more and more that they are my teacher and Mm. I need to step back. And as I watch them, allow them to teach me and empower them to teach me what they need from me as opposed to feeling like I always need to tell them, which I've never been an overpowering parent. However, there's such a fear of seeing your children hurt, which is Mm -hmm. part of growing up. I was just sharing this with one of my students that when my mother got sick, I said to this healer I was working with, I said, well, I just don't want them to feel that pain and that, and that fear. And he said, well, why don't they get to feel it? Mm. And it changed it. And that's what changed the most Mm -hmm. is like, and not just my children that I, my children I've bared, but like the people in my life, Mm -hmm. like that allowing for the back and forth, right? That recognition that we all deserve to feel all of it. Mm -hmm. And we all deserve to experience everything. Because to find that true balance between strength and surrender, you have to feel both. Mm -hmm. To find that true balance between pain and joy, dark and light, like you have to go to the depth of both. Yeah. Or you'll never be in balance. You'll always be leaning a little bit over to one side or the other. Yeah, I love that. We we get to feel these feelings. It's not like we have to go through it. Right. I mean, I it changed my whole world. Just that one thing he said to me, I was like, Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. (laughs) What is something you didn't think you could do and you did? Keep going once my mom died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What gives you hope? Yoga. 
places like this created to bring people to a place so connected to Mother Earth that they can reconnect with themselves. Because life in this world is never going to change until people realize that it starts with an individual, not with a group. And like this group we have here, each individual person that makes up this group came here with an intention to start over, mm -hmm. meaning not start their life over by any means, but to clean it up, mm -hmm. to come back to themselves, to walk away from all the noise and just feel again and move from that place of love. And then once you become love, like Ram Dass says, once you become love, then that's all it is that you give and that's everything that will start to surround you. And the more people we can get to that place, only that's going to change the world. Yeah. I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you define happy? Simple, love, shelter, family. Amazing. What are you curious about right now? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> For real, everything. Uh, you know, a few people that are here uh, are very close, dear people in my life. And one of them says, I wake up every morning and I make a list of three things I'm grateful for. I have another uh, friend and student that wakes up every morning and talks about uh, how she's choosing to be present for everything that shows up, right? And um, I wake up every morning and I decide that I'm going to do one thing I've never done before. Mm. And I guess that's my curiosity. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And this is it. I've never done a podcast oh. before. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I'm honored to be your first time. <laughs> Me too. Is there anything else that's important for you to share? Just super gratitude and, uh, yeah, love and gratitude for you and for what you're doing in this place and this moment. Amazing. I have a lot of gratitude right now as well, <laughs> definitely. How can people stay connected with you? Uh, Brooklyn Yoga Project. There's a website, brooklynyogaproject.com. Um, And, um, yeah, we have a Patreon so you can take class from all over the world. Mm -hmm. They're all recorded classes and we have some live ones, but all the information's on the website. So Amazing. I guess that's a good way to, to say it. <laughs> yeah. And if you're in Brooklyn, make sure to go to her class. I attended her class this morning and it was magical and beautiful. And just the style that I love, like a challenging vinyasa, but not too challenging And with a lot of words of inspiration throughout and your presence was just magical, like very um, powerful and soft and inviting. And I loved it. So make sure to go. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this lesson. Thank you. Now, after this time to nurture your mind and your spirit, we invite you to take a moment to consider others. A kind wish might come to mind. Know that what we learn becomes more valuable when we apply it and share it with others. So share this episode on Instagram stories, tag Yandara and I, or share with a loved one so that more people can benefit from it. Our hope is that the search will lead you home to who you already are, to what was always there. We'll be back next week with more inspiration, honest conversation, and insight into the energetic world around us. Thank you for listening and watching.